Welcome to This Week in Prophecy with James Jacob Prash, presented by Mori LTV. Today is December 30th, 2019, from New York. Jacob. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends from New York City, and Happy New Year to all of you. Greetings in Jesus. Let's begin looking at the close of 2019 and the opening of 2020, as we see this week in prophecy. Within recent hours, it was announced that the United States retaliated against the Iranian orchestrated attack on an American air base near Kirkuk in northern Iraq. This followed a secret meeting and series of meetings held with various allies by State, State Secretary, or Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. As soon as he left, the tax and the counterattacks were underway. The United States heavily hit five targets in Syria and on the Iraqi-Syrian border. But what is unique about this is the attacks on the airbase were orchestrated by Iran. The United States retaliated by directly attacking the Iranian-sponsored Kata'ib Hezbollah, but also Iranian Revolutionary Guards from the Al-Quds Brigade, the Jerusalem Brigade, who were at the forefront of threatening Israel and of carrying Iranian fundamentalism into Iraq. This is the first time the United States has directly targeted Iranian forces in the Middle East, directly attacking Iranian military personnel on the ground. It's been quite a story. It's been described by the Israeli Minister of Foreign Affairs as a game changer. But what is happening now is taking place at al Hakim in Iraq, where uh, the forces of Abu Kamel have been engaged by the Americans. The American strikes in the area around uh, al Qaim and Abu Kamal were in retaliation again for the Iranian attacks and Iranian-sponsored attacks on the American base near Kirkuk. 24 hours after the first 30 rockets were fired at the U.S. base near Kirkuk, in which an American defense contractor was killed and four American military personnel were wounded, the United States directly retaliated. Again, hitting and killing at least a dozen Hezbollah fighters that the Hezbollah admits to, but also directly attacking the Iranians for the first time. The number of Iranian Revolutionary Guards who've been killed has not been disclosed. However, all U.S. bases in the Middle East are on ultra high alert. Again, there was a meeting by Mike Pompeo held at the American air base at Ain al Assad in the uh, aftermath of the attack on the American base. And as soon as he left, the attacks were commenced. The Israeli foreign minister, Israel Katz, said that the U.S. attacking these five Iraqi Kata'ib and Hezbollah targets, as well as the Revolutionary Guards, is a game changer, a game changer. Now the Trump administration has directly targeted Iranians themselves, not simply Iranian-sponsored Syrians of the Assad regime or even Hezbollah, but has directly gone after Iranian forces directly. Meanwhile, in the Middle East, Benjamin Netanyahu, fresh in the aftermath of a sweeping primary victory for the Likud leadership, has two days to apply for a delay in prosecution. Israeli law provides that a prime minister cannot be criminally prosecuted while he is in office. This is not to say that there cannot be a trial at a future point. He's not absolved from trial, but it does say that the trial cannot take place as long as he's in office. He still is in office prior to upcoming elections that are most probable. But in view of this, he has 48 hours. Now it's probably down to about 36 hours in which to apply for a stay of prosecution pending 
his leaving office or some other resolution to the problem. That is taking place this week in prophecy. His victory, however, was politically outstanding for the leadership of the party. The Likud party has solidly lined up on back of him. There were oppositions from the old Likud establishment, but it did not get very far and it did not win. Uh, this is very much in parallel to what we see taking place in the United States, where we have the never Trumpers, the Bush dynasty and their vassals, people like uh, Mitt Romney, the establishment Republicans and the late uh, John McCain, totally opposed to President Trump. But now the Republican Party has broadly lined up on back of him directly, except for Senator Murkowski of Alaska, possibly. But he has consolidated power within his own party. The exact same thing is taking place in Israel. What appears to be a politically motivated prosecution on scant evidence uh, to depose Mr. Netanyahu from power works in tandem and in parallel, in, in contrast to what's happening in the United States. What is transpiring in the United States is transpiring in Israel. The parallelisms, as we've been saying, are absolutely amazing. Additionally, however, the conflict in the Middle East and military confrontation is something that obviously has a political ramification for any future elections in Israel. And it is not only the United States who's been involved in direct combat with Iranian-backed forces. Meanwhile, however, the Revolutionary Guard Chief, Amir al Hajizadeh, was nearly killed. Three of his adjutants were killed in American airstrikes at the headquarters of the Iranian forces in Syria at Agraba, near Damascus. It has been described as the United States saying, you might have gotten away with it this time, but we know exactly where you are. The strikes nearly killed him as they killed some of his deputies. Again, this shows the United States directly, directly attacking Iran and working in tandem with the Israelis in order to do so. Meanwhile, Israeli General Aviv Kohavi, the chief of staff, stated that Iranian missiles could hit Israel by the hundreds. He said that this is improbable, but the Israeli public must be ready for the possibility of it happening. These Iranian missiles, as of yet, do not have nuclear warheads. But with Iran's step up in its nuclear development, the prospects for such a confrontation are obvious. This may precipitate further conflict preemptively between Israel and Iran, possibly involving the United States and possibly involving moderate Gulf Arab states who are notoriously afraid of Iranian aggression. At the same time, Iran is in a situation of political and economic desperation. It has to play a nationalist card of a foreign threat because of the ever collapsing Iranian economy domestically. The massive devaluation of the currency, the inflation, the shortages of commodities and, and, and various products, including food, it is causing major problems inside Iran, not only economically, but socially and politically with protests resulting. We must leave it to the mullahs to play a military card to try to save their necks. Again, the situation is indeed very, very precarious. It is not only, however, in Iran that the United States and Israel have expressed concerns or action this week. There's been a consultation by secure telephone between President Trump and President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, the man who saved Egypt from the Muslim Brotherhood, even though Barack Obama and John Kerry were on the side of the pro-terrorist Muslim Brotherhood. 
General Assisi said in Egypt, consulting this week with President Trump about Libya, we have a further developing situation in Libya. There is the interim government put in place by the United Nations to try to bring stability to the country in the aftermath of the fall of Gaddafi. But they are being challenged by the Libyan National Army, now backed and supported actively by Vladimir Putin and Russia. What Putin did in Syria, trying to get a foothold in Syria, he's now trying to do in Libya. Now, this is purely speculative. We know for sure the main battle of Gog and Magog must be the one at the end of the millennial, uh, millennial reign of Christ in Revelation chapter 20, because that is the one the New Testament specifies. But there are reasons many Christians believe there could be a second battle of Gog and Magog preceding it, simply because they'd be cleaning the debris up from the battlefield for seven months and so forth. Again, it's complicated and controversial argument, theologically and doctrinally. Nonetheless, it is interesting to note that in the constellation of nations, in the Gog and Magog scenario in Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39, there are no Arab countries. It's Turkey, it's Iran, probably Russia, but no Arab countries except one, Libya, known as Put. Now, of course, in biblical times, it was not yet Arab, but it is an Arab country now with a minority Berber population. So we have a situation now where Russia is trying to establish itself strategically in Libya. But not only strategically, it is trying to make an oil deal with the Libyans concerning future development and production. The reason being that fracking in the United States has undermined the global oil markets. This is to the peril of Mr. Putin, as well as to other countries supposedly friendly to the United States, such as the Emirates and Saudi Arabia. But let us consider the following. The American embargoes have greatly, greatly reduced Iranian oil exports. The dilapidation of oil drilling technology in Venezuela and the general decline of the Venezuelan technology, Venezuela having the largest proven reserves, is almost down to next to nothing. So Iran and Saudi Arabia are not factors in the market. Iraq greatly reduced compared to what it at one time had been under Saddam Hussein in terms of its oil production capacity. Also, Libya significantly reduced, trying to rebuild its oil infrastructure. What does that leave? Well, it leaves Saudi Arabia, but the Saudi Arabians have had 50% of their refining capacity destroyed by the Iranian attack last month. Now, all of these things, the combination of these things, had they happened even five or better 10 years ago, would have driven international oil prices through the roof well above $150 or $160 per barrel. As it is, they're between $50 and $60 per barrel. That has been the impact of fracking. Such a crisis in the Middle East, such an attack on the oil refinery of Saudi Arabia, the problems in the Straits of Hormuz with the naval activity, the diminishing of oil output in Venezuela, curtailed output in Iraq and in uh, Libya. All of these things at one time would have caused a monumental oil crunch. It's not happening anymore. The prices are not going back to anything like what they used to be. They're high enough to make fracking profitable but low enough to create economic problems for Russia, certainly for Iran and Venezuela. This is the situation. Hence, while the United States has an upper hand economically, Mr. Putin is desperate to outmaneuver. It has not driven up 
the value or the price of Russian oil or natural gas. In the past, Russia wanted to see conflict and turbulence in the Middle East because it would artificially drive up the value of Russian oil and natural gas for export. That's not happening either. This week in prophecy, the Trump administration signed legislation that would penalize any company engaged in completing the sub-Baltic pipeline from Russia to bring natural gas into Germany. The last 12% of the construction cannot take place because the Swiss company engaged to do it that has the technology. Russia does not have the technology, only the United States and a few other countries, Switzerland being one of them, would be penalized and barred from the American market if they continued the project. Thus, the project is not being completed. We have the Merkel government complaining saying the motive for this is to make Europe dependent upon more expensive American natural gas shipped in super tankers as liquid gas. The United States, of course, says that NATO expressed concern about the dependence on Russian natural gas, given the fact that Russia has already used the energy weapon against countries in Eastern Europe. Be that as it may, the Russian oil industry is under attack by the United States. We have to remember that like, so, like Saudi Arabia, Russia is essentially an oil economy. It's its really main export in addition to weapons. It's, it's oil and natural gas. It needs foreign exchange. Its economy is crippled. They're trying to recover, but without an increase in oil prices and natural gas prices and an ability to export, and meet market demands, it's not going to help Mr. Putin. Fracking has had too much of an impact, far too much. Again, this would have been unthinkable. The Iranian attack on the refinery in, in Saudi Arabia, destroying 50% of, of, of output capacity, what's happening in terms of the naval activity at the Straits of Hormuz, at the entrance to the Persian Gulf, the diminished production of, of, of Venezuela, the export embargo on, on, on Iranian oil, all of these things would have caused oil prices to be astronomical to the benefit of Russia. Not any more. Hence, Russia is trying to react strategically. One of the places is obviously Syria, but another place is obviously now Libya. That is what was taking place in the Middle East this week in prophecy. Meanwhile, in the United States, one of the chief voices demanding impeachment of President Trump from the Democratic Party left has been Congressman John Lewis. John Lewis was one of the first figures in Congress following the electoral defeat of Hillary Clinton in 2016 to openly assert accuse Donald Trump of having come to power through the collusion and with the collusion of Vladimir Putin and Russia in this kind of neo-McCarthyism. He made the accusation, but when this was debunked, when there was no collusion, the Mueller report said there was no evidence of any collusion, he did not withdraw or apologize. Nonetheless, he made a speech. In his speech, an impassioned speech, he said, he knows racism where he sees it. Donald Trump is a racist. He must be impeached. He gave no evidence of Mr. Trump's racism. None. He just says, take my word for it. I know racism when I see it. And he harkens back to the 1950s and 60s when he was an activist against the injustices of, in, of Jim Crow and segregation in the American South. He was a figure, albeit a more minor figure at the time in Selma, Alabama. Well, what he doesn't tell anybody is it was the Democratic Party of the American South that was the party of Jim Crow and segregation 
just as it was the Democratic Party that was the party of slavery. It was the Democrats who control the governments of Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Georgia, the Deep South, that were responsible for the most atrocities perpetrated against the black communities. So now he joins the Democrats, <laughs> expecting people to remain oblivious to historical reality, and accusing Mr. Trump of racism, betraying his own racism. If you disagree with him politically and you're not black, he calls you a racist without any evidence for his claim, for his allegation. This is open political slander. The fact of the matter is, and this is not a political editorial, it's just a fact. Under Barack Obama, after two terms, the average Afro-American family income declined by $900. In the first 11 months of the Trump administration, it increased by $1,000. Afro-American unemployment and Hispanic unemployment are at an all-time low. While Barack Obama was the food stamp president, Donald Trump has been the president of upward mobility for Afro-American and Hispanic minorities and the socioeconomically underprivileged. It is, in fact, Afro-Americans and Hispanic Americans, as well as legal immigrants, who are most hurt by illegal immigration, with their jobs being taken and given to people with no legal right to be in the country. When MS-13 and other drug-dealing gangs invade the United States, it is the Hispanic and the Afro-American communities that suffer the violence and the drug plague the most. But the media lies, and politicians like John Lewis lie. This week it was announced that John Lewis is fighting stage four pancreatic cancer. Is this God's judgment on him? I do not know. I cannot say that. But I can say it wouldn't be happening if God didn't allow it. Similar to him was... Baltimore Congressman Elijah Cummings played the same kind of game, just telling people without reason or evidence that there was racism in the Trump administration and the Trump campaign and that Donald Trump was a bigot. Now notice, before Donald Trump ran for president, no black leader ever called him a racist. He received rewards here in New York City for giving opportunities for upward mobility to black people. He was given rewards for helping blacks to become upwardly mobile economically. But once he becomes a presidential candidate, all of a sudden they call him a racist. The same people who used to like him or at least were um, um, not hostile to him, innocuous. Now there is enemies calling him a racist, but give no reason for it. Well, Elijah Cummings is dead, and the statistical probabilities as John Lewis will soon be also. Now, I hope if he does die that he repents of his sin and comes right with Jesus. And I just don't mean his politics. Like most black Americans, he has Christians in his family, and he certainly knows the gospel. I do not wish the man to go to hell, and I do not wish his death. But I cannot say it is not the judgment of God. He has been notoriously unfair, notoriously hypocritical, and notoriously racist himself. And it's taking place this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, so many things, as usual, have been transpiring in the Middle East. <clears throat> but we have attacks once again on Christians and Jews. Fortunately, in Texas, the Second Amendment is still respected. A gunman entered a church in Texas and opened fire. It was an absolute tragedy what happened at the Church of Christ in West Freeway near Fort Worth. Security officer and possibly members of the congregation who were gun-carrying gun -carrying Christians 
opened fire and killed the armed assailant, undoubtedly saving further lives, although he murdered two people in the church. That is the benefit of the Second Amendment in the opinion of thinking people. Depriving honest people of their right to defend themselves is not going to stop gun crime. I've lived in Great Britain, spent much time in Great Britain, and the strictest gun control I ever saw in my life was in Northern Ireland. Guns are almost completely illegal in Great Britain and in the Republic of Ireland. In Northern Ireland, terrorists and criminals had no problem getting guns. There was tit for tat killings and murders every day, Catholics and Protestants shooting each other in the name of the Christian religion. Every day, no shortage of guns. Bad guys will always get guns. Depriving honest citizens of the rights to defend themselves has not worked. I look at this. What city has the strictest gun control regulations in the United States? Arguably, Chicago. Which city has the most violent gun crime? Chicago. Which state in the United States has the strictest gun control and has been most at odds with the Second Amendment? Connecticut. Okay. Where did the Sandy Hook shootings take place in the school? Connecticut. What state is the most armed in the United States? Louisiana, most guns per capita. What state has the least amount of gun crime? <laughs> you guess outside of New Orleans, Louisiana. You might get shot if you break into somebody's house. But if people are not afraid and they're armed, they'll go in and do what they want. The notion that stripping honest citizens of the means to defend themselves is going to stop gun crime is absurd. I'll go back to Great Britain. Knife crime in the UK, in the United Kingdom, is much worse than knife crime in the United States. They don't have a gun, they will use a knife. It's no less deadly. It is far worse. Also, the burglary rate in the United Kingdom is far worse than in the United States. Yet there's gun control. If there was not gun control in Britain, and I mean within reason now, giving honest citizens the rights to bear arms, there'd be less burglary and less knife crime. Bad people will always get guns. Thank God for those gun-toting Christians in Texas who took that guy down. Tragically, he killed two Christians, but he would have killed a lot more had he not been gunned down. In liberal New York, however, it was not so fortunate. In Muncie, just below the Catskill Mountains, about an hour drive from New York City, or a little less, depending on the traffic, an Orthodox Jewish community. And the house of Rabbi Heim Rotenberg, someone from uh, Greenwood Lake on the New Jersey, New York state line, came with a machete and attempted to hack worshipers to death, lighting the Hanukkah, celebrating Hanukkah. Now, just before I came to New York, I celebrated Hanukkah with my wife and my daughter. Uh, and my grandson, we, we, we just had Hanukkah before I came to New York. I can only think of my own family. When I think of a church being shot up, I think of my own family going to church. When I think of Jews being attacked celebrating Hanukkah, as Jesus celebrated Hanukkah in John chapter 10 in the New Testament, I think of my own family. Christians getting shot, Jews being attacked. This, of course, all stems from Genesis 3. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. As we've always said, anti-Semitism, Jew hatred, and persecution of the true church are heads and tails. They are two sides of the same coin. We can distinguish between them, but we cannot separate them. Satan hates the people of God, the Jews, and he hates the children of God born-again believers. He hates them. Hence, 
it's Christians and it's Jews who are the victims. Yet the media is always worried about Islamophobia this week in prophecy. A number of Christians in northeast Nigeria were beheaded as a Christmas present by Boko Haram or Boko Haram faction linked to ISIS. It's going on all over the place. It's unending, and most of it's not even reported in terms of persecution of Christians. In 2019, nearly 5,000 Christians have been martyred for their faith. In 2019, this year, presently coming to a close, it is best estimated 245,000 Christians have been under persecution. Yet we're supposed to worry about Islamophobia and homophobia. This is a gross injustice. Attacks on mosques are much, much rarer. Attacks on homosexuals are much rarer than attacks on Orthodox Jews. This week in New York and Brooklyn, a Jewish lady pushing a baby in a, in a carriage was physically attacked in front of the child in the carriage watching his mother get beaten by some anti-Semitic woman. The assailant in Muncie, New York, who attacked the rabbi's home with the machete when they were lighting the Hanukkah candles, was followed to Harlem by his license plate and he was apprehended and arrested. I only wish New York had had the gun culture of Texas so that guy could have been brought down. People have the right to defend themselves. Jesus made this clear. If you knew what hour a thief was coming to your home, you'd protect it. The New Testament does not forbid self-defense. So it is. It's terrible that during the week of Hanukkah, Hanukkah is marred by such an attack. This follows the attack two weeks ago in Jersey City, New Jersey. Not far from where I'm seated, a place I once lived. Again, four Jews attacked by a militant hate group driven by anti-Semitism and racial hatred. Now we have the Muncie attacks. The same politicians who are up in arms about it are essentially accessories to it by denying people the right to defend themselves. Nonetheless, this is the world we live in. The New Testament and the Old Testament make it clear what is going to transpire in the last days. We may be sure from the Judeo-Christian scriptures that hatred of Israel and the Jews and hatred of the true church are going to increase. We do ask for prayer. The perpetrator of this crime, his name uh, was Thomas. His name was, um, sorry, his name was Grafton Thomas. The perpetrator of this th crime, Grafton Thomas, was charged not only with a hate crime, but with domestic terror. These are acts of domestic terrorism. That's what is taking place. And it's been taking place this week in prophecy. Once more, the impeachment charade continues to drag on without the articles of impeachment being delivered against President Trump. So it goes. It is being maintained that the Democratic Party and its liberal access does not, do not believe there will be a fair trial in the Senate. That is their basis for withholding the articles of impeachment. The articles of impeachment were rushed through the House, not with bilateral support, but only with support of the Democratic Party and not even all Democrats. It was pushed through amidst much criticism of Mr. Trump not being represented, not being able to call witnesses or to have his lawyers cross-examine the witnesses brought against him. None of the witnesses brought against him, however, could charge him with a specific crime. Adam Schiff, 
insisted he had evidence of bribery and extortion. But there's no bribery or extortion in the impeachment, the impeachment being the equivalent of an indictment. Now Mrs. Pelosi wants to control the way the Senate is going to run the trial, even though constitutionally she has no mandate to do so. The House exclusively brings impeachment. The Senate exclusively runs the trial. Again, we see an attack on the Constitution. When a nation turns away from the Judeo-Christian principles, from the principles of Scripture that engendered its freedom, the freedom begins to disappear. This is what is happening this week in prophecy. Also this week in prophecy, something has happened in Great Britain that is an embarrassment to the LGBTQ community. A transsexual female, as she calls herself, having herself sculpturally remodeled to resemble a male, even though the chromosomes <laughs> in every cell of her body say that she is, he is, still a ma- uh, she is still double X, not a male, not XY gave birth to a baby. So even after the female sex changed to resemble a male, claiming to be a male, legally recognized as a male, she had a baby. I thought that women are supposed to have babies, but here a woman who calls herself a man has had a baby. These people are out of their mind. They don't know what they're doing. I want to become a man so I can have a baby. It is complete madness. Complete madness. It's a society that's lost its mind. But we know what to expect. Please keep President Trump in our prayers. Please keep Boris Johnson, also born in New York City, in our prayers. Please may justice prevail in this ugly, ugly fiasco. The Durham investigations are being conducted at the moment for prosecutorial purposes. Uh, We know about the corruption in what is called the deep state in the intelligence community. Where you have a bogus dossier paid for by the Hillary Clinton campaign that the FBI knew was false, and yet they lied about it, and presented it to the FISA court and then continued to lie. Most people think there needs to be indictments of people like John Brennan, of certainly uh, James, of Comey, and of James Clapper. Uh, May justice prevail. May the Lord's justice prevail in this situation. Again, we do not politically editorialize. We're only praying for justice. We are praying for the vengeance that is the Lord's, not man's. Again, I hope Congressman Lewis repents of his sin, but I cannot dismiss the possibility of him being under God's judgment, as was Elijah Cummings, quite possibly. It's not for me to say that. I don't know, but I certainly would not rule it out. Vengeance is mine, say it the Lord. May all of us be cognizant of our own sin and needs for repentance in our personal lives. But so it is here in New York City as we prepare to celebrate New Year. God bless and thank you for joining us on this week in prophecy. Mm-hmm.